It's a pleasure to introduce the last speaker of this session, uh, Jerry Tuscan. Jerry is a corporate fellow and a group lead at uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory. He's a member of uh, BESC. Uh, I've, I've followed Jerry's science for a number of years. There are different kinds of scientists. There are some that are like tumbleweeds, you know, spin from one area to another. Jerry's like a tree. He, he's been studying poplar from above the ground and below the ground. Uh, he led the Poplar Genome Project. He's done lots of, you know, uh, uh, using that sequence and doing SNP studies and pop population variations. And I think one of the advantages of, of being like a tree is you, you can see subtleties by under, having a deep understanding of the biology of the organism that you don't get when you're a tumbleweed. And I think Jerry is going to present some of this very interesting biology uh, his tree-like approach. Identification, isolation of genes that influence Lacaria colonization in poplars. Thank you, Eddie. Well, thanks for the invitation to speak. It's really a pleasure to be here. And I'm standing here representing a whole team of people that have spent years of work um, trying to understand the relationship between poplar and Lacaria. And how this relates to bioenergy is that ultimately, if we capture 40 million acres of agricultural quality land, we're going to have to do it in a sustainable way, which means we'd like to favor beneficial relationships, particularly with fungi that can increase water accumulation or phosphate uptake. And so we began studying through collaborations in France and, um, and at Duke uh, the relationship between poplar and many, many fungal associates. And I'm going to highlight some of the work that's been accomplished over the last few years here. So there's a hidden molecular language that plants and microbes use to communicate with each other. And it involves proteins and metabolites and possibly RNAs. And they're exchanged between plants and bacteria and metabolites. The beneficial, commensal, or de detrimental relationships that uh, ultimately occur happen before there's intimate contact between these organisms. So we know that there's signaling molecules that are being exchanged in the open environment. And if we could understand that language, we could control the way um, bacteria and plants, or fungi and plants, or even fungi and bacteria interact with each other. And so our goal was to begin to understand those relationships as a means of increasing sustainability. Um, so I'm going to present two examples. One is evidence for poplar-based small proteins as signaling molecules. And the other is the discovery of a D-mannose binding lectin kinase that influences Lacaria colonization. So let's start with the first example. This work was led by uh, Shohan Yang. He's the team lead for this. And we leveraged a gene atlas resource where we had looked at RNA-seq information from colonized and controlled plants and did subtractive characterizations of the RNA signals. And in that, we found that there were 2,800 differentially expressed um, proteins that met our criteria for um, small proteins. These are uh, amino acid or peptides, um, amino acid chains or peptides that are 250 amino acids or less in size. We did a series of proteomic characterizations, and we looked at full-length um, messenger RNA and narrowed that down to 2,600 small proteins. Typically, they have a, a no exon or a single um, exon, no intron structure. And as I said, they, um, most of them were uncharacterized. So 60% of these are not annotated in genomes. We then computationally subdivided them into two sets, a small protein set and a secreted protein set. And that ultimately led to this list of 417 uh, proteins that met those criteria. When we looked at those, and that's this set here, I don't know if I can hit it over there, but um, among, all the small protein, among all the proteins we saw, there was this enrichment for small secreted proteins, and there was an enrichment for nuclear localization. So we see that there's predictions for localization among many, many subcellular components, but it's certainly enriched in the cytoplasm and the nucleus. We then examined these small proteins across phylogenetic space, and it varied greatly between proteins. So these are, these are peptides, 250 amino acids or less, and typically about 100 amino acids. And some of them occur, and this is a protein that was not annotated in the poplar genome, occur across phylogenetic space in high copy number. So there's many, many, many of these found in alternate plant species. Now, if you think about why are they annotated or why are they not, not annotated, 
If you go to ab initio gene calling algorithms, you get a high false positive call rate for things less than 250 amino acids. And so they typically are cut off artificially as a threshold for high confidence annotation. But we have both RNA evidence and protein evidence that these things are real. There are other members of the small protein, uh, small secreted proteins that are found only in poplar. And so here we see poplar and it's a three copy number. And there are others that are found in closely related organisms and not found in anything else. So this began to make us wonder, do they have specific arrangements or associations with metabolic functions or plant microbe interactions? We looked at the predicted localization and we used a poplar uh, protoplast transinfection assay. I hope you can see that, it's a little dark. And so this was predicted to um, bind to plasma membranes and in fact it did. This particular small protein was predicted to localize to chloroplasts, in fact it did. This to nucleus, this to nucleus, and this to both the plasma membrane and the nucleus or nucle nuclear envelope, and in fact it did. And so we went through all 417 of these looking at where their subcellular localizations were. In doing that, we also discovered an interesting thing. I hope I can get this to run here. And so what you're about to see, I hope you can see that. For the first time, we identified a protein that had affinity to, to vesicular um, movement. And so what you're actually seeing here, and this has never been reported or documented before, is a protein that has affinity to the plasma membrane. This is in a tobacco leaf tr uh, transient expression assay. And you can actually see vesicular movement. So these are biologically functional um, entities. We know that they occur in poplar. They, we know that they localized a certain subcellular components of, of the cell. So then we wanted to look at are they secreted. So we used a yeast secretion assay. And so here you see, um, this is a, the construct we used to test this in yeast, a positive control, negative control, and many, many of these proteins that were predicted to be secreted among the 417 are in fact secreted in yeast. So these are poplar proteins that um, have the machinery or the capability to move outside the membranes in a heterologous system. We then uh, synthesized these proteins, put them in media, and fed them to Lecaria. And so you have a negative control here, um, you see no uh, GFP signal here, uh, nuclear localization signal here, and no co-localization. Uh, Here's a positive control. Um, this particular protein doesn't have the nuclear trafficking motif, and it, it does not move into the nucleus. But all of these that were predicted to be secreted and move into the nucleus, in fact, moved into the nucleus of Lecaria. So here you have a poplar protein that moves across the poplar membrane into the media, out of the media across Lecaria's membrane, and then localizes to Lecaria and in its nucleus. And when we looked at that, we saw changes in the morphology of Lecaria. So these are the same proteins that you see listed here. The four that moved into the nucleus are here, and that there was a significant change in branching distance and in, um, in growth of the mycelium. So these proteins, originally produced in poplar, appear to change the behavior of an alternate organism. And so we're very excited about this as a mechanism and a way of controlling the interactions between poplar and, fun and uh, the fungus Lecaria. Now let's talk about demanoselectin kinase. I'll talk a little bit about how it was discovered, um, how we cloned the gene, we put it in Arabidopsis and the results we saw. So we have a large GWAS population of about 1,084 genotypes of a non-domesticated, uh, outcrossed heterozygous organism. Uh, we collected these across the Pacific Northwest. We resequenced them to a minimum of an 18x depth thanks to the horsepower of JGI and the ability to do this and created an unprecedented resource. There is no other public resource as deep and as rich as this. We have 48 million SNPs. There's a SNP every 10 base pair. So when we do GWAS analysis, we have huge precision. We can not only identify the region of the genome that causes the gene to be associated with a phenotype, but we can identify the causal variant at the amino acid level um, difference. We then applied that to a series of phenotypes. Um, this happens to be for lignin. We look for associations. Um, the significant LOD score is about seven to eight. And we're getting LOD scores of 45, 65. 
And that's logarithmic. And so we have highly, highly significant associations between individual genes and, in fact, individual codons and amino acids at a protein level and associations with phenotypes. So we brought this to bear on the Lacaria colonization issue. And we wanted to know, are there genes that control uh, colonization? And the team leads here were Wellington and uh, Jesse. Um, Jesse has a poster, I think it's uh, 44, who, uh, and he'll be presenting it later on, so you can stop by and hopefully talk to him more about it. But within the associations using a QTL analysis approach, there were nine genes within a, 98, a 95 KB region. We identified PC, uh, we created uh, PCR primers for each of those, and a single gene, a D-mannose uh, binding or receptor kinase, was linked successfully to colonization. So among all the candidates within the region, there was only a single gene that so showed significant associations. These genes are known mostly in mammalian systems for interacting with uh, bacteria in the gut. And so we knew that that had a role with um, associations with uh, um, microfauna inside the human gut, and we wanted to understand a little bit more about how it was uh, interplaying with Lacaria. This is the structure of the gene. This is how we believe it's bound between the apoplast and the cytoplasm. Um, the cytoplasm. There's a D-mannose binding uh, domain or motif. There are several other motifs on this particular member. This is a large, large gene family, but it has affinity to mannose, which is a polysaccharide component of Lacaria's cell wall. We then cloned it into Arabidopsis. Now, Arabidopsis is a 30-day annual, and there are no known mycorrhizal associates with Arabidopsis. And so we put the poplar gene into Arabidopsis, and you see here, this is the wild type. Uh, you see the root architecture. I hope you can see the root architecture there. We then introduced Lacaria, which are these positions here. We found um, no colonization. We then looked at, um, uh, this is Lacaria, uh, this is Arabidopsis with the D-mannose lectin kinase without Lacaria and we significantly changed the root architecture. So the gene itself, independent of Lacaria, forms a root architecture which is more favorable for colonization. There are a larger number of root tips that are produced in the presence of this poplar gene, and the root, um, not only in root branching, but root length is increased, and then we inoculated it with Lacaria. These are close-ups of the picture. This is a wild type. Uh, this is a wild type Arabidopsis and uh, inoculated with Lacaria at 10x, 20x, and 80x. I'll draw your attention to a couple things. There are changes in root hair architecture in the presence of Lacaria and the d lectin kinase. Here you have a, an Arabidopsis root tip, and you can see the hyphae growing right over the root tips. It grows as if it doesn't recognize the, a potential host and continues to grow, and Arabidopsis continues to grow normally. But in the presence of the transgene, you get multiple branching, so you see more branching, and you get this architecture formed around the root tips. And it, we'll look at a close-up here, and it forms what looks like a Hartig net, which is the classic um, formation of uh, fungal colonization. When we did cross sections, you can actually see fungal invasions into the Arabidopsis root tip. So this is the first time we've, anybody's been able to get colonization of a fungus onto Arabidopsis using a poplar gene. So uh, my time is short, and there's a whirlwind tour and hopefully somewhat of a deep dive into two aspects of the Bioenergy Center. Um, in summary, uh, bacterial and fungal um, communities are diverse and abundant and vary by rhizospheric compartments in poplar. Um, there are small secreted proteins in poplar that appear to be translocated into the nucleus of Lacaria. There's a poplar gene, d mannoselectin uh, kinase, that appears to trigger or influence Lacaria colonization. And um, we're exploring these as mechanisms or ways to control the behavior of both the host and its associated microbiome. I want to acknowledge all the people, not all of them, many of the people that have contributed to this. Uh, lots of these folks are in the audience. Dale is here, um, Jesse is here, um, Greg is here, Tim's here, so please take some time and talk to them. They'll give you a lot more technical detail than I've been able to give. I want to acknowledge all our partners, DOE and the JGI, Hudson Alpha, of course, and then this is funded under two projects, uh, a plant microbe interaction SFA, 
and the websites there, and the Bioenergy Center at Oak Ridge and the websites there. And with that, I'll answer any questions you might have. It's good seeing you, Phil. Um, so, uh, how specific do you think the, this interaction is between the poplar and the lacaria in terms of taking up the secreted protein into the lacaria? I mean, do you think it's happening with other fungi or even bacteria? We're in the process of looking at that. There's a, um, 417 of these, and it's a laborious process of doing binary combinations of, of fungi. We have about 5,000 fungi isolated from poplar rhizosphere in culture. And we have about 8,000 bacterial isolates also isolated from poplar. And doing the binary combinations of that is just outrageous. So we've begun doing them on selected sets of um, fungi and bacteria. And it appears that there is a, uh, some small proteins that move across a variety of taxa, microbial taxa, and some that are very specific. I think that's reflected in that phylogenetic tree. So those that appear to have more diverse uh, host ranges um, appear to be found in multiple species, plant species. So the, uh, the D. manos kinase uh, you mentioned, uh, what's its phylogenetic distribution? Is but, it? So the, the lectin kinases are a very large family, as you know, and the sub family of this has many members as well, and it's found across a lot of plant species. So we think this is a, uh, probably a universal signaling um, receptor um, associated with Lacaria, and as you know, Lacaria has a broad host range as well. But is it present in Arabidopsis then? Shouldn't no, it's not present in Arabidopsis, no. So uh, two quick questions. Uh, when you see Arabidopsis, Lacaria, uh, interaction, do you see any uh, like uh, stress, like uh, higher anthocyanin accumulation yeah. or early bolting? That's a great question because ultimately the fungus kills Arabidopsis. And so it's not a true functioning mycorrhizal association. It does colonize the roots, but it will continue. And we used a 35S promoter and it'll colonize the leaves ultimately. And then it'll colonize the whole plant and then the plant uh, dies. So we're putting this on a root-specific promoter and we're gonna look at uh, the ability of Arabidopsis to tolerate this. But um, the process, as you could see, took weeks and uh, uh, colonization took weeks. And Arabidopsis uh, hangs around in a physiologically um, juvenile state for a very brief period of time. So we're not sure we'll actually um, successfully colonize in the sense of forming a healthy, beneficial, or um, commensal relationship. And another quick question, do you know the, if the, colon, uh, the colonization is intracellular or intracellular? It's intercellular, so it f the hyphae go in between the host cells, yeah. Okay. So how would you like to tame these interactions for what could you imagine? Well, I think there's a, there's a lot more signaling going on than we were aware of, and there are a lot more molecules involved in this signaling. And by taking a, a broad genomics approach, as opposed to a one protein at a time approach, I think we'll be able to tease apart some of these um, communication mechanisms. And, about their application. Yeah. And, and in doing that, then, we should be able to favorably influence how individual fungi interact with individual plant species. There are environments, um, when we talk about capturing bioenergy and we're looking at 10 to 40 million acres of land, that isn't the black soil of Iowa. That's the marginal lands in the Great Plains. That's the marginal lands in the Pacific Northwest and the Southeast. They are under drought stress. And so by favorably uh, encouraging these associations, we might be able to move plant systems onto less favorable lands. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Eddie. Okay.